Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mind Body Green's beauty podcast, Lean Beauty School. I am your host and Mind Body Green's beauty director, Alexandra Engler. On this podcast, we explore beauty through the lens of well being. And on today's episode, I am chatting with Fiona Stiles. She is the famed celebrity and, ed- and editorial makeup artist. I am a longtime fan of hers. And she is also the founder of the shopping destination Reed Clark. It is this treasure trove of really beautiful uh, skincare and hair care and makeup finds. And so, you know, I'm I'm so excited to chat with her about how she goes about curation and just, you know, her makeup tips in general. So without further ado, Fiona, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Well, I'm so excited to, uh, you know, hear more from you. We have we have been able to have a quick call, but, you know, I, I'm so excited to get into the thick of it on today's episode. I, I always love to start these these episodes by allowing the audience to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, you know, what? what is your journey into the beauty industry and, you know, more specifically makeup? I mean, let's see. I would have to say that I've always been a bit of a beauty tourist and a beauty hunter. Um, in high school, I grew up in Northern California and I would take the public transportation into San Francisco to go search for makeup. And um, there was a, one theatrical store on Polk Street that sold this incredible red lipstick and I would just stock up on it. It's just something that's always sort of lit me up. And uh, I, when I go on vacations, I drag my husband to all different parts of towns based solely on makeup shopping. <laughs> Whether it's Tokyo or Paris or London, I'm dragging him everywhere. We either are on public transportation trying to get there or it, it, it's interesting because it always makes it part of our journey together and on travel. If I'm on a press tour, the first thing I do is hit you know, boots on the ground, going to a pharmacy or trying to find the local makeup stores. It's just something that's just been a part of me ever since I can remember. Um, My journey into makeup, I went to fine art school. I went to the Rhode Island School of Design to study photography. And while I was there, I was always doing my friend's makeup. I was always doing my own makeup. I used to wear a lot of makeup in high school. And um, when I graduated, I moved to New York City and literally fell into the beauty industry. Um, I never worked at a counter. I just, I would have little journals where I would cut out people's uh, work from Allure or from Harper's and Vogue, and I would have their names written down next to makeup, not the photographer, not the publication, but always just the makeup artist. And I ended up just sort of like falling into the industry. It was a very different time. Uh, It was very, very obtuse and hard to get into. I eventually just found the white pages and started calling people whose names I'd written down and asking if they needed an assistant. <laughs> Old school DMs, right? Like just, I don't know. No kidding. That's incredible. <laughs> Tenacity and ignorance. Good combination. <laughs> More tenacity, I would say. Okay, so, you know, you're making all these calls. You, um, at what point, you know, do you feel that you have made it as a makeup artist? You know, like you, you're, you're so beloved in the industry now. So, you know, what, what takes you from making these cold calls to the Fiona styles that we know today? It's a pretty long journey because I didn't follow any traditional path. I wasn't someone's assistant for many years. I was always just trying to pen peck my career and put it all together, right? So I would do a little of this and a little of that, and I would take any job that came my way. I worked in a cafe while I was testing. I would do some advertising, some fashion, some catalog. I've always done lots of things within the industry. So I love fashion, but I also did commercials, and I would do music videos, and I would do catalog, and Target was one of my first clients, and I really learned how to do different skin tones because their casting was always so wonderful and diverse with age and race. And that was where I kind of cut my teeth and learned how to do skin because it was very light also. Um, even now, I still like doing catalog. I still like doing commercials. I like working with models. I love working with my beautiful actors. Uh, I I like being a bit diverse within my industry. Yeah, I mean, certainly when you look at your clients that that shows through um i mean you work with 
some of my favorite people who consistently show up on the red carpet with just like incredible looks like Gabrielle Union. She's always incredible. Lily Collins, like her looks are just so fantastic. Um, which kind of brings me to the question that I wanted to ask you was how would you describe your aesthetic and your makeup style? Because, you know, you, you create such beautiful works, but there's so much variety within it. Do you feel that you have an aesthetic style or, you know, do you feel like it bounces around? How would you, yeah, how do you describe it? I feel like I do my best to honor the person in my chair. So whether that is um, someone like Lily Collins, who is who's truly a chameleon, I can make her look like anything. She can adopt any character, which is really fun, um, to like a school mom friend who doesn't know how to do their makeup and who hasn't worn makeup in 20 years. I honor the person sitting in front of me because they're the ones who have to go out into the world looking hopefully their best. But I don't feel like it's fair to push my look on other people. I do have an aesthetic. I do have I make choices, aesthetic choices, but I also am always considering the person who is in front of me because I don't want them to feel I don't want them to feel uncomfortable when they are on the carpet. I don't want them to feel uncomfortable on a talk show. They're already in these incredible high pressure situations, which I truly cannot imagine what that feels like, that energy coming at you, those screams and the cameras and the turn this way and look over here. So I just want them to feel like the best version of themselves, but that has to start with who they are. There are people who want crazy transformations for every event, and that's fine too, but I also really want I really want the person who's sitting there to feel like I really look like the best version of myself. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned skin earlier because you were talking about, you know, doing commercial makeup with like Target, for example. And you do really great work with skin and it just looks so luminous. Um, I, I, I would assume that that is a part of how, you know, you would describe your aesthetic, like mastering the art of just beautiful skin. Uh, it's hard, though. You know, how did you craft that technique? Again, it comes from editorial catalog and then moving to red carpet. So I really did editorial for about 15 years, 10, 15 years before I moved to Los Angeles. And when I, you know, when you're on a photo shoot, there's lighting, there's no BTS, there's retouching. You've got a 16 year old in your chair. Perhaps there are pimples, but you know those are going to disappear in retouching. You can, you have a, there's just a lot more wiggle room for editorial. But at the same time, so many photographers are like, I don't want to see foundation. I don't want to see anything on the skin. I want it to look like perfect skin, but I want to see skin texture. Well, that's very different from the red carpet. And when you are doing someone for the red carpet, there is no retouching. There is no second chance. So you better get it right the first time which often requires more makeup than maybe you would do for editorial or maybe even in real life because it has to look so flawless when it's photographed. And those pictures live forever. Maybe we're still seeing pictures from the 80s and 90s, 70s, 60s. They always pop up. So you want to make sure you get it right because someone will find it. Yeah. What is your beauty philosophy? It's a similar question to what I asked you about your aesthetic, but I think this is a little bit more broad. So I would have to say that my beauty philosophy, again, honor the person in the chair and less is more. Uh, you know, we, we're just sort of coming out of a very, very heavy 10 years of makeup. And it, it has been almost 10 years. Um, you know, things are cyclical, even though we feel like we have these trends that happen instantaneously or you know, over the next day. Really, if you look at trends, they are sort of decades long. And I feel like for the last decade, we have been in a very, very heavy makeup environment. Lots and lots of products. And you see people squirting foundation onto their face. And uh, just it, it makes me anxious. <laughs> I see application like that. Wait, talk about this more. I'm so fascinated because I totally agree with you. It feels like we're just inundated with product and makeup, but you're a makeup artist and you're saying this. This feels very refreshing to me. Oh, yeah. I find it overwhelming. As a woman, I find it utterly overwhelming that this is what you're supposed to do. That that these faces with, um, they'll paint, you know, there was a big trend of people putting red under their eyes, and then they would put a layer of concealer, and then another layer of concealer, and another layer of, layer of concealer. And even if you're 16, it's going to look insane when you step outside. It's overwhelming. It makes women feel um, less than. It makes you feel like you can't achieve something. And 
I'm a little bit punk rock in the fact that I just, that stuff makes me nuts. And I don't think it's fair for women to have that extra burden of not only like needing thousands of dollars worth of products, but needing, feeling like they have a need to wear 20 products at a time, multiple layers of something. It's confusing. It's, uh, it's a barrier to entry. It just makes me sort of angry. <laughs> so I feel like we're sort of coming out of that. We've got We've got Hayley Bieber and Rogue, where it's sort of skin first. We've got uh, Merit. And finally, there are some brands that are like, you don't have to cover everything. You don't have to do a cut crease. You don't have to have two sets of lashes. You don't have to have overdrawn lip liner. You don't have to have contour and blush and highlighter. And you can see skin and it's okay. I completely agree with you, especially, you know, hitting on the fact that for so long, it just felt like we were in such a I don't know, like a tornado of product and it just and tornado of trends and just it felt so overwhelming. And um, I certainly see light at the end of the tunnel and see that we are coming out and, you know, see that people are embracing skin again. But it does give me um, it. I don't know. It makes me feel something for the people who grew up in that time frame, especially when they were super young and impressionable. Um and, you know, you grew up watching YouTube videos or, you know, now Instagram and TikTok of just, you know, use 17 different products to cover your face. And it's like, what does that do to somebody's like little formative brain, you know? And here's something that sort of bothered me for a few years <clears throat> is that when I was that age, when I was a teenager, no makeup brands were talking to me. It was Chanel and Dior. And unless you wanted Wet n Wild or some very low quality drugstore product because back then the drugstore products were abysmal they have come such a long way i think you can just get incredible products at the drugstore now but no one was speaking to me as a teenager then and then i kind of ignored pop culture for 20 years and then as a 52 year old woman excuse me as a 52 year old woman no one is talking to me again and even when i had my makeup line i was like i want to talk to the women who are in their 40s and 50s and people who don't want all of this theatrical sort of drag based sculpting but what real women want to wear and now i feel like a little bit at least with merit as someone in the second half of my century i can look at that and go i get that i understand that and i like to try and see things from a consumer point of view as well as um a professional point of view do you feel that we i mean you mentioned a few brands that you feel are making strides in this respect but you know do you have hope for the future that we're going to be more inclusive when it comes to you know talking to a wider range of ages and generations because you know i i certainly agree with you that um we hyper focus on the youth or you know 20s or so um do you do you have hope that you know, it's widening. I think Gen X women are getting pretty vocal. Well, I think we've always been a little bit, I think we've always been vocal, but I do enjoy seeing the conversation. I do enjoy seeing the conversations around menopause and aging. And if you want to do injectables and sort of boost your self-confidence and age in that way, that's fine too. But I also see women who are just like, you know, I'm going gray. I'm not going to do inje injectables. This is my face. I'm never going to look better than I do with this moment if I don't do injectables. So enjoy who I am today. And um, I'm looking forward to being alongside women who are comfortable with getting older and showing that they're getting older and doing it with style. I mean, you don't have to wear 17-inch zipper mom jeans just because you're over 50. You also don't have to be a real housewife. You don't have to be this like super hot, weirdly sexualized human being. You don't have to be a dowdy, uh, you know, cast off. You can live somewhere in between and be beautiful and feel beautiful in your body. It would just be nice to see brands speak to that. There's 1999. I think they're doing a great job. Um, I look forward to uh, to like an expansion of their product range, but I would like to see more. Yeah. Um. I, I, I want to switch gears just a little bit. Um. Although I certainly love this conversation that we that we fell into. Um. You describe yourself as somebody who is formula obsessed. Uh, when did that start? You know, obviously you're somebody in the in the beauty industry and all of us in the beauty industry do 
I think on some level have an appreciation for formulas, or at least when you're in it long enough, you start to. Um, but, you know, as somebody who describes as formula obsessed, is this something that has developed over time? Is this something that came along with your makeup line? Is this something that came along with Reed Clark? Like, at what point were you like, oh, formula is this fascinating to me? I want to dive deeper into this area. For me, it's more about the way something feels or the innovation of a product. That's the part of formula that really gets me. I touch thousands of products a year. You, I mean, you worked in magazines, you worked in publishing, you were, you're, you had products across your desk all the time. And it takes a lot to sort of stop you in your tracks and be like, oh, that's interesting. Or I haven't really seen that before. Or that payoff is different than I thought it would be. And that's the start. That, um, that's the stuff that gets me excited. Right. So um, something like when Ritual Defeat came out with their Ash and Ember Isots, I was like, well, what is this texture? This is incredible. I've never really felt anything like this before. And they're making it themselves. Um, not, it's not, it wasn't created by a chemist. It was created by makeup artists. Um, that's the kind of stuff when I say I'm a, I'm formula obsessed, it's not necessarily the ingredient deck, although I do appreciate a clean ingredient deck for me. It's like, what is the payoff? How is this interacting with my skin? What is this interesting new texture or delivery system or finish? Uh, I see a lot of mediocrity. I see a lot of same, same, especially as the YouTube explosion happened. I felt like one person would have a successful product and then eight people would also just emulate that product. Um, so when I see something unique, that's what makes me sit up straight. And that is what ends up on Reed Clark is when I find something that I'm, I find interesting. I make a lot of choices about Reed Clark where I don't carry things that a lot of other websites carry because they might be very good, but they don't spark joy in me. So... When you say spark joy, I mean, is it like truly just a feeling or do you have to play around with the product to get that? I, you know, I'm just, you have such a keen eye for this, right? And clearly when you look at Reed Clark, it's just, it has a strong point of view within the curation. Um, and I find it so fascinating hearing about how people go about curating their routines and how, you know, somebody like yourself goes about curating it. So, you know, when you say spark joy, what are the different levels of spark joy? And, you know, what are the different ways that it can spark joy? I'm sure there's kind of multiple feelings. Right. So sometimes a product, I'll either research a product or something will end up on my doorstep or I buy something and instantly I'm just like, I have to have this. I have to tell everybody about this. It has to be on the website. Sometimes I sit with something for a year and then I go, okay, I've really lived with this product. I really can see its value. Maybe it was a slow burn for me, but I can really see how other people would enjoy this right now. Reed Clark started because I would be using something on someone at my chair and they would ask where I got it. And I would say something like, it's a weird little pharmacy I found in New York or something I got in Japan. And this was nine years ago, so it was a very different space online and it was harder to find things. And there weren't create like curated beauty sites that were quite like this. I feel like now there's lots of them. Um and so for me, I just wanted to have a place where I could I could sell them for, for people and express like why I love them so much. I don't know if you remember. So for me, it's a little bit like um Jake Peterson catalog. Do you <laughs> there was like a whole episode on Seinfeld about Jake Peterson? They would build stories around every product. Every story, this every product description was this incredible story. And and that's sort of how I feel about Reed Clark. It's it's also my relationship with that product that I'm having. And that's why I'm presenting it to another person. Like, who who waxes poetic about a deodorant? But like, I love the deodorant I saw on there. And I will tell anybody about it longer than they want to hear about it. Okay, two follow-up questions then. One, what is the deodorant? <laughs> it's soap voila, and it is a paste. It is you know, again, barrier to entry. Some people don't want to put a paste in their armpits, but I have gone camping for weekends. I have landed on a red eye in the summer in New York, walked the streets for four hours, and then gone to work and had no business with my armpit anywhere near anyone's face. And I smell like a daisy. I put it to the test. <laughs> I'm sold. Second follow-up question is, I love how you describe it as a relationship with your beauty products. Um, I often describe beauty as a relationship 
we all have a relationship with beauty. Um, you may not even realize you have a relationship with beauty and that is your relationship with beauty. Um, and so I love that you describe it that way. And I love that you have relationship, individual relationships with your products. When you go about and you talk about these relationships, what's your process of building that story and building that, you know, highlighting the things that you want to talk about? And and perhaps I'm asking this of, of you because I'm a writer, I'm an editor, this is what I do every day. And I think it's fascinating to hear, you know, how people pick out the things that they want to highlight and, and you know, wh- what are the strengths of these relationships that you're highlighting? I write all the copy for my website. I write everything. Uh, so it's very personal to me. And I think you can really feel when I'm extra passionate about a product. It gets a little more b- verbose. I get a little flowery in my descriptions about stuff. Um, it's just, I mean, you know, relationships with beauty are interesting and complicated. And sometimes there's, there's, I mean, it's all I've done for 30 years. It's the only real job I've ever had is being a makeup artist other than jobs which supported me becoming a makeup artist. So it's all I know. And if you put me and another makeup artist in a room, all we're going to talk about is product. That's it. We might like circle around family or the industry, but ultimately it's like, oh, what's in your setback? What, what new stuff have you found recently? And it's this beautiful connection that we have with other people. And for me, Reed Clark was about really sharing that passionate connection. I also love supporting small businesses. Like I love I love the heritage brands. Um, but you can get those anywhere. I like the I like the digging. I like you know if I was a DJ, I would be going through digging through the crates. You know, I consider Ree Clark like digging through the crates of beauty. What's over here? What's in that? What's in that pharmacy? What is interesting that's happening in Korea or Japan? Yeah. One thing that's notable when you look at the website is you know not only are these high quality um beautiful formulas that use you know great ingredients and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's also just beautiful and the products themselves are beautiful and that makes me think that you prioritize creating beauty within the routine as well am i right in that assumption so while i respond to beautiful packaging Again, I feel like I'm a little agnostic because I will carry a drugstore product. I'll carry a scar cream. I'll carry things that I think um, are efficacious and just honestly really good products. Um, If I could curate it where it was only incredibly beautifully designed products, I think it might also be a little intimidating for people and they may not feel welcome there. And I I want someone to feel like they can come in and buy an eyelash curler or uh, an eyeliner that they might actually find at Whole Foods because I sell my favorite eyeliner for Mineral Fusion. Maybe one of the only products I've restocked in my kit repeatedly for 10 years. Um, I just want everyone to feel welcome there. So yes, I do think beautiful products, beautiful routine, but also you can't always buy a $78 moisturizer. And if you do, you're going to need to fill it in with, you know, $12 eyeliner. Yeah. No, I mean, I I think that's a very fair answer. Um, And, you know, to your point, creating something that feels inclusive, I think, is really important, especially when you um, are on this side of the industry that is more about, you know, like clean formulas and stuff like that. It can feel very exclusive a lot of the time, you know, so why i think that your answer highlights why why you know why inclusivity is clearly important for you in general you know it's not only important with the work that you do and the work the makeup artistry that you put out there but you know it's it's a pervasive throughout you know your entire ethos i think that's really interesting and i also feel like there are incredible formulations that are not that expensive uh i mean i used to carry a scar cream on the website because it was incredible that this scar cream worked. Sadly, they will only sell to uh, dermatologists now. But, but you know, th- I just want it to be products that people use and go, oh my God, this is actually really, really, really good. And it was $100 or it was $10. But I don't carry anything on the site that I don't use myself and that I think is subpar. That's that's my bar. That's my bar for me. Aesthetics are lovely. 
Uh, but again, I was I also just want I want it to be stuff that works. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of stuff that works, let's flip the coin over. Um, I'm not going to ask you to call out anything, obviously. However, you're somebody who obviously tries quite a bit um, and has spent a lot of time doing so. Is there any type of product or product category that you feel that maybe hasn't been quite mastered yet? Um, You know, whether it's a certain shade of blush or um, a type of serum. Like, is there anything that we haven't quite gotten right? Oh, I have a lot of opinions about this. (laughs) (laughs) How much time do you have, Alex? (laughs) All the time in the world for you. (laughs) Here's where I think... uh, and I'm giving away, I'm giving it away here. Like brands, reach out to me if you would like to uh, hear more about this. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it away for free. I feel like we are very lacking still here in 2023 with formulations for darker skin tones and for very fair skin tones, uh, and also Latina skin tones. Like we are missing, even with 42 shades in a in a brand we are still missing certain shades that work well for people. I work with a very fair-skinned woman, Lily Collins, and I work with a very melanated-skinned woman, Gabrielle Union. So I'm constantly looking on both ends of that spectrum for the perfect product. So I think blushes, contours, bronzers for fair skin, blushes, contours, and uh, bronzers for darker skin. And then I think feel like Latina skin is just widely ignored and and southeast asian like where are our olive colors where are they i have a very fair question is it the undertones or is it just the scope is it yeah everything it's the undertones so most blushes um this is why i turn to japanese and korean formulations often because uh of this Skin tone, they just create different colors for fair skin that don't really exist on this market. Or there's a brand like Sunny's Face, which is based out of the Philippines, which really works for olive skin tone. Um, their pinks and reds work so beautifully on on darker olive skin tones. A- again, that's what they focused on. And I, that's why I find them such a fascinating brand, because it really serves a community that has been underserved. Yeah. I obviously I very much agree with you. Um, and it is interesting that we've made such a huge push over the last several years, you know, with these huge foundation ranges and, you know, um, the push for inclusivity has certainly it's been much, much louder. Um, but I think it just goes to show that, like, the problem is that it has been lacking for so long that there's just so much catching up to do, you know? Yeah, I'm so grateful for what Fenty did because they just blew the lid off everything. And as someone who had a uh, makeup line, I felt pushback from retailers about shade range. So I'm glad that she was just like, I don't really care what you think. This is what I'm doing. And it was massive. And I'm so, I'm grateful for it as a professional and I'm grateful for it as a human being. Um. I just think that there probably need to be more women of color on the other end of product development. Sure. You yeah. just have to change the person who's who's in the lab as well as the as the availability to the consumer. No, I mean, truly, I was having a conversation with another guest on on the podcast and you know, she was explaining to me she is a product developer and she, you know, is in the lab and she was explaining that um you know, most uh, ingredient testing is only done on folks with like fair to maybe like medium skin tones. Um, and so, you know, most of like, even like the safety data testing is it done on a wide range of skin tone. And it's it's such a pervasive problem that there's just so much work that needs to be done to correct it. Mm-hmm. When I was developing my foundations, I would go through the office and I would grab anybody I could who looked like they would be a good match for the skin tone to make sure that this worked. One of the things I found the most shocking when I did my product development was uh, when we were testing eyeshadows, they handed me a bunch of sponge tip applicators and they were applying it on their arms. And I was like, nobody one that wears eyeshadow on their arm. So this doesn't seem like a good place to test the product. (laughs) I said, give me some makeup brushes and I'm going to put them on my eyes until my eyes were raw because I needed to see what the consumer payoff is 
then most people are using a sponge tip applicator or maybe 50%. But there's, I was really stunned by the disconnect in the lab and that environment with the end user. They said I was the very first person who ever tested eyeshadows with a eyeshadow brush. Shocking. That's so fascinating. And I think you're absolutely right because the little samples that you know you get sent from the lab samples aren't how you actually use it in your day-to-day life. And so I, there is that inherent disconnect there because you're not trying it as the end consumer. This has inspired a new question of me. And um, how do you think the industry has changed since you crafted your makeup line uh, several years ago? In what ways is has it changed for the better? In what ways has it changed for the worse? I was very fortunate to get to do that. I'm very sad that it didn't make it. Uh, it was a really, really, really rough time for brands. If you did not come out, because it was sort of the height of Kylie. So if you didn't come out and sell out immediately, if you didn't go viral, you were not successful. And that's also not who I am as a person. I'm a slow burn. Like I I am not a squeaky wheel. I just do good work and I just keep going and I keep working. And that's what I had hoped for the brand is that people would discover it and realize how excellent the products were in formulations and then it would grow. But that wasn't that just wasn't the trajectory. But I do feel like um, we are hopefully in a less, I mean, I I say that only because I'm not on TikTok. I was going to say, I hope we're in a less viral world, but I don't think that's true. (laughs) Um, But I do hope that we are, like I said earlier, sort of coming out of this very artificial, heavy uh, aesthetic and moving into something a little bit more reasonable. Yeah, your uh, your work was so ahead of its time i feel like it would it would resonate i feel like now more more so than ever because you're right it was the kind of kylie i was very quiet i was a quiet brand which is who i am as a person so it was just not good timing if i ever get the opportunity again and by the way i get an email literally every week of someone asking me when i'm gonna relaunch every week for seven years wow i mean the audience is there y'all it is (laughs) you wouldn't hear any complaints of me over here if (laughs) that happened so maybe one day yeah well i you're wearing a red lip and i did want to ask you what is the key to a good red lip so um you know you you do such a fantastic job as we've talked about earlier but you do such a fantastic job of, you know, highlighting one thing at a time and just like really getting that one thing just so beautiful and so lush and, you know, all all the words. So what's the key to a good red lip? Um, it's funny because I just wrote a whole blog post on this for Reed Clark, which is probably coming out in a week or two. Um, red lip takes commitment, patience and attention like a relationship. It will fail you if you don't have those things. So um, I think that first of all, I think anyone can wear a red lip. You just need to find your shade and you need to find your, uh, I'm trying not to be crass. You need to find your, say balls, but (laughs) you have to kind of own a red lip and not let the red lip wear you, right? I think it comes down to formula, what feels comfortable. This one is Violette's. It feels like nothing on the lips. It's a liquid lipstick. It's not heavy or sticky. It's great. Um, So I really like this one. I think that if you're going to be wearing a red lip IRL, a liquid formula is kind of the way to go because it requires less maintenance, less attention. Okay. But then you just have to find the one that feels good. Do you have any tips on specific shades or is that, I mean, that's probably so individual, right? That's like a little rule for me. You know what I mean? Like a redhead can't wear a brick. Red. I just, I don't, it, it's all about how you feel and you're living within your red lip, like what you bring to it. You can wear anything as long as you just do it with confidence, truly. But if you're sheepish about it, then it's going to overpower you. Um, when I do a red lip on another person, I require patience. Lily is like a statue when I do her red lips, but she also knows that I will give her a perfect crisp red lip. I approach it from a painterly uh, technique where I just fill in the middle and then, and this works for regular people as well. I fill in the middle so that I get a little bit of emollience and then I can sort of push the edge with the edge of my brush so that 
there's just a little bit of color already on the edge of the brush and that will make the sharp line. And I use a very small brush when I do that. I use a big brush to lay down the color. Yeah, no, I mean, that does sound very much painterly. That sounds like a work of art. That was a technique I learned at art school. <laughs> it's like a way to push paint and get a sharp line. Um, but it's all about the brush and it's all about patience. Okay. All right. Patience, everybody. I can do that. I, I feel like I used to wear red lips all the time. And I don't know, something happened in the pandemic where I just, I've kind of struggled to get back into doing the bold looks. Um, and I don't really know what that says or what that means or how I should even interpret that within myself. But for some reason, I, I've struggled to kind of like get back to that point where I'm doing it. You can always dip your toe in it by, um, you know, patting a little bit on. And then some, sometimes I'll take a domed uh, eyeshadow brush and I'll just buff out the line so that it doesn't feel quite so painted on. I like a painted on lip, but at the same time, it's not for everyone. So if you, I mean, you've got gorgeous, beautifully defined lips naturally. So you could just do that and maybe you wouldn't feel quite like it's quite such a bold look. But then just pair it with some mascara and put on a sundress and go enjoy your summer New York day. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> um, all right. What do you find that when you're talking with with people, um, what are some of the most common hangups with makeup? And, you know, where do you see people struggle with? Um, because I do feel like people do, they have hangups with makeup and they have things that are, you know, they, they tend to find harder to grasp. What, what do you find that people tell you about? Well, okay, so I'm in my 50s and I have a kid. So my community really is moms, right? Like, I mean, they're all younger than I am. But not very many women in my community wear makeup. They wear a little mascara. They maybe wear a tinted lip balm. And literally every single one says, I don't know how to wear makeup. I don't know how to put it on. I haven't worn makeup since high school or I just wear a little bit. And they sort of get stuck in this place where they don't know how to move forward. You need to meet your makeup in whatever decade you're in, right? When you're in your teens and 20s, you can kind of do anything. In your 30s, you're, you still can do anything, but you're kind of like figuring out who you are. And then as you get into your 40s, 50s, 60s, your starting point is very different from where it was in your 20s and 30s. You're going to have to do more correcting and it can just sort of feel overwhelming. And, you know, you can't do a winged eyeliner that you used to be able to do because the skin is creepier and you're not going to get a super crisp line. So you need to adapt you need to adapt as you get older. And, and I don't think a lot of people know what that looks like. I did uh, I did a mom friend's makeup the other day. She had to do photos. I've never seen her in a stitch of makeup. And all I did was um, a little liquid liner between the lash line to make her lashes look thicker. I curled her lashes. I did black mascara on the top. I did brown mascara on the bottom. I gave her a little bronzer so it wouldn't, cream bronzer, so it wouldn't cover her freckles with a tiny bit of like a, 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 brownie, berry colored cheeks. So with tiniest flush and then like a little lip. And she was like, oh my God. And I, I groomed her brows uh, with the KS and Co brow gel. And she was just like, I feel like myself, but I feel like a better version of myself. And I think there's just a little education for especially women who, who don't exactly know where to start. Um, there's a few simple tricks and tips that, that will make you feel more pulled together without making you feel like uh, an inauthentic version of yourself. So would those places to be start, like, would they be the brows? Would they be, you know, like reworking eyeliner, stuff like that? I think a good brow does wonders. Um, I'm always talking about just for men using it on my brows because I'm blonde. And as you get older, your brows get thinner and they seem to sort of disappear. And I use that as a great way to anchor my face. Uh, I do it once a month. Um, I think just sort of having that tidiness on that part of your face does a lot of heavy lifting. It gives your face definition. I think curled lashes and mascara, a good mascara. I think eyeliner is, you know, take it or leave it. I love the taupe eyeliner from Mineral Fusion that I talked about earlier. It's the color is called rough. I think I've gone through 20 pencils. Um, it is, it's a very soft taupey color. And so it gives your eye definition without Heaviness, I think people think they need to wear a black eyeliner or a brown eyeliner and it closes their eyes up and they get freaked out and they they don't know what to do with it. So um, it's just a little outside of the box thinking as you experiment with makeup. Okay, so the last section is I talk about what you use. 
Um, we're obviously going to start with beauty. Um, I, I would love to hear your skincare, uh, skincare routine. And, you know, I, I'm not sure how involved your skincare routine. So if you don't want to get into everything, I totally get it. But I would love a little like synopsis. <laughs> I, you know, I'm always trying stuff out for Reed Clark, so I'm I'm terrible because I have no routine. Uh, I have brands that I love, and then I'm I just my husband's side of the sink has nothing, and mine is just covered in skincare products. Um, I do love Mary Allen. She's a uh, she makes hand makes all of her skincare up in Northern California. Her stuff is beautiful. Um, I like uh, Shawnee Darden. Uh, I love Augustinus Bader. And uh, and then I kind of try anything. There's a spa here called Surya, and they sent me some products that are incredible. And uh, I use them till they run out. I don't, I haven't bought skincare in maybe a decade because it just lands on my doorstep. I'm very fortunate that way that I get to try all these things. But it also kind of means that I'm not in a routine. Skin Medica, I love Skin Medica, and um, any any Japanese products that land on my doorstep also. Yeah. And makeup. What are some of your makeup faves? So I have large pores and oily skin, so I'm constantly struggling to find the right foundation. Um, I tend to use water-based foundations because I've found that they don't exaggerate my pores. There's a tiny brand called 14E that has very beautiful, very thin formulations because I don't want to cover anything. I just want to even it out a little bit. The Sicily skincare, oh, sorry, the Sicily under eye products are phenomenal. I think it's called Stilo Lumiere. is unbelievable. I'm, I use those all the time. Um, let's see. I love the Tom Ford. They don't make them anymore. They're so beautiful. Tom Ford cream eyeshadows, KS and Co brow gel. I use it every single day. Her tinted brow gels are fantastic. And I recently have been using Thrive Cosmetics mascara because I don't look in the mirror, the tubing one. I don't look in the mirror when I work. And sometimes when I use other mascaras, it's a bit of a shock when I look in the mirror. <laughs> it's traveled a little bit. Um, the Surat Releve is another favorite of mine, and that one doesn't budge also. So for me, it's about like, can I leave my house at seven in the morning and come home at seven at night and not look like a hot mess? All right. So that's what's not moving. Good to know. I also like the Thrive Cosmetics one. They also have a really good brow gel. I don't know if you've ever used their brow gel, but I'm I'm into it. I haven't. I don't generally like the brow gels that have a lot of pigment in them, which is why I like the KS and, o, KS and Co. Because they're tinted, but there's no weight. There's no uh, particulate in it. Like with the Glossier brow, and I'm assuming the Thrive and Charlotte Tilbury and some others, which are which are great, but they kind of make the brows look gunked up and and matte whereas the ks and co just kind of darkens them one shade okay um yeah this one is a little bit uh thicker it's definitely like adds that volume and that thickness um so you may not like it but um okay and then the last thing i always ask everybody is how they take care of themselves as i've explained to you before this is open to any sort of interpretation that you want to take it um, you know, it can be how you fall asleep at night. It can be, you know, what, what you eat. It can be laughing with your kid, whatever you want to, however you take care of yourself. Uh, Hired Dose was kind enough to send me their, uh, PEMF mat recently, the infrared mat. So that is something that literally my whole family uses, including the dogs. Um, that's a really nice way to relax at the end of the day. Um, I like to call it the bone marrow warmer because it <laughs> gets really warm and you just feel super relaxed. Um, I also love the uh, compression boots from Therabody. Those are unbelievable after a long day on set. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, on your feet all day. Oh my God, they feel incredible. Again, my whole family steals them from me, but um, it's a family affair, so that's great. I wish I had more time for... Um, general kindness to myself but it does take a backseat having two full-time jobs and being a parent and being a wife so um you know i do pilates whenever i can and i I, my job is very physical i'm carrying a 70 pound kit around all day lugging it in and out of my car i stand all day i do squats while i do makeup because 
uh, I can't sit and work at the same time. And the chair is usually low for the hairdresser. So um, I feel like I get a lot of physical activity at work. <laughs> and then I'm fortunate enough to get all this beautiful skincare. That's that's my self-care is testing products. Yeah. I I mean, honestly, this sounds like a very well-rounded routine. Um, and, you know, I... I just wanted to say thank you again for joining me today. I I know I, that I gushed in my email to you, but I am a longtime fan. So this was really so fantastic to, to have you on today and to chat with you. And um, I just really appreciate you taking the time and sharing all your intel with us. It's always great talking to a beauty editor. I feel like we share a similar language and um, not everyone can understand when people get so you know effusive about beauty products. So it's always good talking to a fellow beauty nerd. I I also get very excited and I always love hearing about everybody's, you know, favorite finds. And certainly you have um, a very high, uh, you know, threshold of what you consider good. So I love hearing about how how you create that um, high bar for, for, for Reed Clarks. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate it.